Come on, fish. Don't run at me. Fishing is one of the most popular pastimes in Idaho's beautiful outdoors. It's challenging, it's exciting for all ages, and it fuels hours of storytelling about landing the big one. They are beautiful fish. But have you ever wondered where all those big, beautiful trout come from that are stocked in Idaho's lakes and streams? Or why, even in a time of difficulty for Idaho's salmon populations, anglers can still enjoy the thrilling challenge of landing a feisty salmon or steelhead? Many of our favorite fishing holes owe their success to Idaho's fish hatchery programs. fish lay their eggs in the gravel bottom of a stream or a lake. After the male fertilizes the eggs, some of them will hatch and the tiny fish called fry begin a turbulent new life. It's tough living, filled with predators and challenges that ensure only the strongest, healthiest fish survive. The ones who live to adulthood will, in turn, lay eggs and a new generation of fish will be born. It's a cycle of nature developed over millions of years. In a hatchery, that cycle of nature gets an extra boost. That's because survival rates in hatcheries are much higher than in the wild. More eggs are fertilized and hatched into healthy fish. Here, there are no predators, so more fish grow fat for release into lakes and streams. Idaho's anglers benefit with more trout to catch and more salmon to reel in. At the same time, hatchery programs conduct valuable research and some hatcheries are saving certain stocks of salmon from total extinction. But to understand how Idaho's hatcheries first started, you must step back in time, back to the days of the Wild West and the Great Gold Rush. This is the first hatchery building or, or the first one that he built. Bud Ainsworth is a third generation fish culturist. His grandfather, Joseph Sherwood, was an entrepreneur and the owner of one of Idaho's first fish hatcheries. It was the 1880s and a mining boom in nearby Montana attracted thousands of workers. The miners needed food. So locals in eastern Idaho made a year-round business out of catching cutthroat trout. In winter, the fishermen spent long hours on a frozen solid Henry's Lake, catching boxes full of fish. Out on the ice. Oh group of people, uh, all the people, that, the local people, that's what they did in the wintertime because there wasn't any other jobs. So. But the thriving commercial fishery threatened to wipe out the local trout population. Bud's grandfather saw the writing on the wall. He felt like that uh, they were depleting the Henry's Lake cutthroat too much commercially and so he, he felt like he should start rearing some cutthroat putting them back in Henry's Lake. Sherwood converted an old barn into a cultivation house. He collected eggs and sperm from wild trout. He filled wooden boxes with water to hold the tiny fish. And over the next three decades, the Henry's Lake hatchery released tens of thousands of cutthroat trout. It was the beginning of Idaho's long hatchery history. In 1907, the first state-owned hatchery opened its doors. Haysburg Hatchery in central Idaho was constructed to produce trout for nearby waters. Soon, state hatchery managers learned what Joseph Sherwood already knew. Raising fish takes a lot of food. And in the days before refrigerators, rounding up fresh food every day took a lot of hard work. In the early days, of course, uh Hatchery uh, programs were pretty much fed uh, off of horse meat and horse meat byproducts. Uh, we did a lot of grinding of, of uh, older horses and the liver and spleen uh, products. It was a wet diet that were kind of ladled into uh, the, uh, the raceways by hand. Fisheries manager Tom Rogers says because food was so difficult to come by, early hatcheries only held fish a short time, releasing them at just a few inches long. When it came time to transport thousands of pounds of fingerling fish, it took nothing short of hard work and sweat to get the job done. As late as the 1950s, hatchery fish were transported in 10-gallon cream cans. The cans were topped off with ice to keep the fish cool. 
then loaded onto Model T trucks and mule trains for delivery to Idaho waters. But sometimes the mule trains turned into a flying fish rodeo. Some of the old mule trains might have been uh, actually uh, planting fish on the trail going into the receiving waters. Well, good. In a few cases, mule trains still continue today. This Idaho Department of Fish and Game fish taxi delivers tiny trout fry into hard to reach high alpine lakes. Mix a little lake water with it here. I'll use them into it in the little home. Lightweight plastic bags have replaced heavy metal cream cans, and that's just one of the many advancements in fish transportation. In the 1940s, airplanes took the weight off the backs of many mule trains. Today, most alpine lakes are stocked with a splash from the air. On the ground, hatchery managers replace small containers with larger truck tanks. Distribution units are on the go all summer, transporting trout to accessible fishing waters throughout the state. But loading the fish was still backbreaking work. By the mid-1950s, fish hatcheries scattered across the state were raising everything from rainbow trout to bass to salmon. About that time, a major change in fish cultivation altered the way every hatchery raised fish. The invention of a dry, pellet-like fish food eliminated the need for fresh ground meat. The food, still used today, stores more readily, packs more protein and vitamins, and is more efficient, meaning it takes less dry food to put more weight on each fish. Dry food caused a major shift in hatchery cultivation. It reduced labor and mechanized the feeding of fish. And it allowed hatcheries across Idaho to raise fish beyond the fingerling size and up to catchable size, 8 to 12 inches long. At the same time, improvements in transportation made moving the fish safer and easier. Today, stainless steel tankers equipped with oxygen tanks and water temperature controls cause less stress on the fish and increased survival rates. The basics of fish cultivation have not changed much since Idaho's first hatchery opened its doors at the turn of the last century. Those basics remain true in modern fish hatcheries, and modern fish hatcheries face many of the same old challenges. One major challenge is disease. Just like people in a big crowded city, Fish crowded into hatchery raceways can quickly spread disease, but today, scientific advancements have made great strides in raising healthy, disease-free fish, which won't adversely impact their wild cousins. We uh, handle somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 cases a year here at the Eagle Lab. Eagle Fish Health Lab near Boise is recognized as one of the best in the country among our nation's state wildlife agencies. It works much like a hospital for humans, only here the patients are fish. Hatchery trout, salmon, steelhead, and even wild fish. And just like humans, fish can suffer from various diseases caused by different viruses, bacteria, or parasites. Okay, these are rainbow trout from one of our hatcheries um, over in central Idaho. We have a condition where they are potentially carriers of a bacterial disease. When any of Idaho's 25 hatcheries calls with a problem, the lab will perform a series of diagnostic tests on the ailing fish. Eagle Hatchery is also one of the last refuges for endangered Idaho sockeye salmon. Like Chinook salmon and steelhead, sockeye are called anadromous fish. Fish that begin life in fresh water, journey to the ocean, and then return to fresh water to spawn. This is a small population of fish uh, uh, in danger of, of extinction, certainly, if, if it not, were not for this program. In 1991, only four adult sockeye salmon returned from the ocean to their natural birthplace in the Sawtooth Mountains. In the fall of 1990, there were none. No question sockeye salmon teeter on the edge of extinction. The Eagle Fish Hatchery is trying to keep this species alive. Jeff Heindel is a fish culturist at the lab. I like to think of us as a bank. We are uh, preserving a small uh, portion of genetic material uh, so that if, if someday in the future uh, migration conditions change which might uh, favor an adramus fish in, Ida in Idaho, we can take this captive population, this gene pool, release it back out into the wild 
take a hands-off approach and allow this, uh, you, you would still have the genetics there for this fish to be able to, to re uh, return naturally without man's intervention. The program is already working. In the 2000 migration season, more than 200 sockeye salmon raised at the Eagle Hatchery and released into the wild returned to their native spawning grounds at Redfish Lake. It was the biggest return in a decade. Today, many salmon hatcheries are racing against extinction, and hatchery managers are doing everything they can to raise healthy fish that survive in the wild. Modern hatcheries simulate the natural environment with baffles that provide shade and camouflage raceways. Salmon actually change in color to adapt to their surroundings, so the camouflage will prepare them for a natural stream better than the traditional cement raceways. Hatchery raised salmon are marked by clipping a fin and in some cases even sterilized so they don't crossbreed and weaken wild stalks of fish. And hatchery salmon perform another valuable function. They allow anglers to take home salmon species that otherwise they'd have to let go. If these fishermen on the Salmon River caught a wild salmon, they'd have to release it back to the river. But a surplus of hatchery raised Chinook means a bonus for the dinner table. Over the past century, Idaho's fish hatcheries made great strides in improving Idaho's fisheries. From resident hatcheries that raise trout, bass, and other local species, to salmon hatcheries which are working to save endangered sockeye, chinook, and steelhead, to research hatcheries which are improving the health and survival rates of all fish. These continued advancements in cultivation, rearing technology, and fish transportation ensure Idaho's hatchery fish will swim strongly into the future.